the main challenge with silicon um, as the substrate for photovoltaics is that that silicon is an indirect band gap uh, material. So that means we need a lot of material to absorb a sufficient amount of, of sunlight, sufficient amount of photons to create the power we want uh, from the solar cells. So we need a lot of material. We need much more than uh, for thin film solar cells, for example, uh, that are made from direct semiconductors. So a typical sil silicon solar cell is about 180 microns uh, thick. So that's actually a much thicker than a, a typical thin film solar cell, only being a few uh, microns or even less. Uh, that also means we have to pay a price when it comes to energy. Uh, so, um, and, and the story there is that because the cell is thick, uh, when we generate an electron hole pair within the bulk of the material, it needs to, on average, travel a long way compared to in a, in a thin film cell to reach the metal contacts that are typically on the front and the back in order to be collected. And because, uh, because of that, the quality of the material needs to be really high uh, in order for the uh, charge carriers not to just recombine. So this is a, a very important balance in all silicon solar cells, the balance between recombination and the lifetime of the charge carriers. And in order to, to optimize the cells in this regard, we need the, uh, the highest possible quality um, of the material. The challenge uh, of that is that that typically costs a lot of money in the production. So the, most, uh, the, the highest efficiency silicon cells are made from uh, monocrystalline, uh, single crystalline silicon, typically made from the Sokalski method, where a, a, a cylindrical ingot is grown uh, from a monocrystalline seed that means we only have one crystal, so all the crystal planes are aligned within this material. We don't have any uh, grain boundaries, and that means we minimize the recombination in, in the bulk. Um, but this is an expensive way because of producing silicon wafers and cells because we need to, to grow this ingot uh, in a very clean environment, and we need to have a, a silicon uh, melt, a molten silicon, where we draw this ingot from, and that's typically uh, quite expensive. And it's more expensive compared to the multicrystalline uh, silicon cells that are cast in a, in a mold. Um, so when we do that, we get grains uh, of different crystal orientation, which gives recombination at the grain boundaries. But it is a cheaper way of, of manufacturing the, the wafers and therefore also the cells. So we have these two main categories of silicon cells, one being slightly more expensive to produce and slightly more efficient and one being slightly cheaper and slightly less efficient. And the only reason that they're both still in the market uh, today, multicrystalline represent about 70% of the, the global market and monocrystalline about 25%, um, is that their price in terms of dollar per kilowatt hour is almost the same, roughly. Um, and if it weren't so, probably one of them would have gone out of the market already. If we look at the, the problem or the challenge with, with silicon as an indirect band gap material, uh, it has to do with the, uh, the absorption of photons, and that absorption is wavelength dependent. So short wavelengths are very energetic and they're being absorbed uh, very close to the top surface or the surface where the photons are incoming. Uh, you, know, the, you could also put it in another way that a very thin cell would be able to absorb short wavelengths but when we, it comes to the longer wavelengths that are less energetic, uh, they, it takes more um, uh, material, it takes a thicker wafer to absorb these longer wavelengths. So if we look at the solar spectrum, the infrared and the near-infrared part of the spectrum uh, is, actually, is actually very important uh, to optimize the output of, of solar cells. And therefore, uh, the red and infrared uh, wavelengths are difficult for silicon solar cells to absorb and to get the full potential out of. In order to solve this, a lot is being done in silicon solar cells. Besides having a sufficiently thick wafer, um, which is not really the, which doesn't solve everything because we can't pay uh, an uh, infinite price of just going to thicker wafers. Um, what is being done instead is to try to achieve what's called light trapping. So we basically ensure that the photons that uh, are not absorbed within uh, an absorption length of uh, equivalent to the thickness of the wafer, that they bounce back and forth a couple of times until they are absorbed. 
So in order to ensure this, we need the photons to be reflected back when they reach the back surface of the of the solar cell, and and um, preferably being reflected back and forth between the rear and the top surface within the bulk of the material until it is being absorbed. This requires that we make a good mirror uh, on the back side of the cell. Uh, that could just be metal, but it could also be uh, an oxide layer or a dielectric layer with a metal on the back, and we could also structure the rear of the cell. So all these things uh, are measures in order to uh, trap the light and enhance the absorption of infrared uh, wavelengths. If we look at the efficiencies of silicon solar cell, which is of course very important uh, in terms of the output of power that we're all interested in, um, the theoretical uh, maxim maximum called the sharply quizzer limit for silicon solar cells um, is around 29%. Um, and this is limited by the band gap of the material. You can, you can basically calculate that if you assume that we absorb all the photons that we can with this material and we use all uh, of, of this photon energy to create electrical energy and we collect all of that energy, uh, all of those electrons, um, we can get that theoretical efficiency. Um, so that's assuming a lot of perfect scenarios, ideal scenarios. And of course, uh, it's very, very challenging to reach that in, in practice. But actually, silicon solar cells are becoming, uh, are, are approaching, uh, the efficiency of silicon cells are approaching this theoretical limit. Uh, the current um, record for monocrystalline cells that are the most efficient is 26.3%. Um, so if you look at that cell, it, it doesn't lose a lot uh, uh, when it comes to neither optical or electrical losses. Uh, so basically, a silicon solar cell is one big balance between optical and electrical uh, losses. And typically, if you optimize one of the things, it comes in uh, on behalf of, of, of another parameter. Um, so, uh, yeah, as an, as an example, um, if you want a completely non-reflecting surface, you can texture uh, the top surface of, of silicon in various ways. And I've worked a lot with nanostructures where we can actually texture the cell to be completely black. That means the reflection is zero, uh, essentially zero across the, the whole solar spectrum. That's of course nice, and it's a very interesting feature with these nanostructures. But when you do that, and if you do nothing else, you've also electrically completely ruined your surface. You've created a much larger surface area with a lot of dangling bonds, and that means a lot of surface recombination. So you enhance the optical properties, and you degrade the electrical properties. So we have to do something in addition to that. So if we look at what's been done and, and what's left to achieve the, the really the theoretically uh, maximum possible efficiency of silicon solar cells, um, what's left is uh, both some optical and some electrical losses that are still present. So um, even the record solar cells today still have some reflection. Uh, Actually, most, uh, even the best uh, monocrystalline cells, uh, if you look at them and if you measure the reflectance, they still reflect a lot of the blue and um, ultraviolet uh, light. And this is what we attempt to solve with the black silicon nanostructures that makes this reflection actually go away. But in order for that to uh, result in a record efficiency, you also need to passivate the surface really, really well in order not to just lose the uh, electrons that are being the excess electrons that are being generated from, from this excess absorption. A lot is also being done on the rear of the cell in order to achieve perfect light trapping. Um, this is challenging because uh, you may, it, it, or it's quite uh, easy to get some effect. If you make a mirror on the rear, you will see photons uh, with long wavelength bounce back and forth. But in order to make uh, all the available wavelengths uh, be trapped or bounce back and forth uh, sufficient amount of time to actually be collected, to, 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 to generate uh, charge carriers that are then being collected, uh, requires uh, a very, very high quality material. And it also requires a perfect light trapping scheme, uh, which is sometimes hard to realize, even though we know in theory what should be done. Um, uh, and we should also um, preferably uh, make the cell even uh, even thinner 
to increase the collection probability and thereby uh, increase the, the, the voltage uh, and the current of the cell. So there are still a few things to be done to, to really raise this uh, efficiency. Um, when we now talk about making cells thinner, uh, as I said before, there's actually a potential gain in the efficiency to be, to be reached here. There's also um, a reduction in price, of course. Uh, the, the smaller amount of silicon we can get away with using and still create the high efficiency, um, the cheaper the production, um, at least when it comes to raw material usage. But there are some practical limitations that when we get uh, below, say, 100 micrometer thickness, um, silicon wafers become very hard to, to handle in an industrial uh, uh, production. Um, remember, we need to produce thousands of six inch silicon uh, cells per hour uh, to get the economies of scale that the silicon industry uh, produced today. So these wafers must be handled uh, very fast, very controlled. That involves uh, robotic arms moving the wafers. It involves large boats and cassettes going into furnaces and different clean room environment. And when silicon becomes thinner than, uh, say, 100 micrometer, uh, roughly, it starts acting like a foil and it starts becoming quite fragile. Um, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it starts to become uh, practically challenging. Besides the theoretical uh, considerations of having an optimal thickness, um, there are a lot of measures actually being put into producing thin silicon wafers, and with that I don't mean thin film thin film silicon, as in a few hundred nanometers grown uh, amorphous silicon layer. Um, but I actually also refer to monocrystalline silicon wafers being grown or being uh, produced at a thickness of say 50 uh, micrometers on that order. Um, that's very attractive because that thickness is just enough to get the ideal optical properties if you have perfect light trapping, good texturing and so on. And it's ideal electrically in order to collect uh, the charge carriers being produced. Uh, what's not so ideal or what's challenging is how do we produce volumes equivalent to the solar, the silicon solar industry today with those thin wafers. So there are a couple of, of uh, companies and also research activities um, going into how do we do that? Uh, should we grow a wafer epitaxially uh, from silicon? Um, should we make a, a, a wafer production a bit like the multicrystalline production where we grow, um, oh sorry, where we, uh, where we cast uh, the wafers in a mold? So instead of uh, growing an ingot, uh, that we cut out, maybe we grow or maybe we cast each wafer. Uh, that would probably make it multicrystalline, but if we make it high quality, then we don't lose anything from from sawing the wafers. So that's actually a big a big topic. How do we avoid the the curve loss uh, in, in in sawing out uh, wafers? Um, so going to thinner silicon cells is a big topic uh, in order to reduce the the price. To, to answer the question of how do we go from the 26.3% record we have now for, for monocrystalline um, and up to the, the theoretical uh, limit, uh, we need to suppress the last piece of reflection that these cells still have. We need to optimize light trapping of long wavelengths. Um, we need even higher uh, material quality uh, so that the bulk lifetime increases. And we need to do whatever we can to passivate the front and rear surface. Passivation uh, really comes down to how can we get away with uh, passivating the whole surface um, the best way possible while still having electrical contacts that collect the current. If you look at the record cell uh, from Kaneka, it's, it's, um, uh, it excels in that the technology is able to create um, a heterojunction uh, with uh, a very good passivation uh, and collect the current from these surfaces without ruining that passivation. Uh, so that's, that's an important point that should be improved even further if we want to uh, reach the theoretical maximum. Uh, when we look at multicrystalline cells, 
that uh, have a record around uh, 22%. Um, those cells, in addition to all the factors just mentioned for the monocrystalline, have the challenge of uh, the grain boundaries. At the grain boundaries, we have an increased risk of recombination of the charge carriers. So these grain boundaries must be, um, well, preferably uh, minimized in the production, uh, but that's hard if you still want to keep the cheap production method of the, the multicrystalline wafers. Um, these grain boundaries must be passivated. So there's a lot of work going into uh, passivating grain boundaries in multicrystalline material. Uh, for example, using hydrogen passivation, where you could incorporate a lot of hydrogen in, uh, say, the anti-reflective coating. Typically, that's a hydrogenated silicon nitride. And then if you, in the production of the cell, of the silicon cell, heat treat it appropriately, you could incorporate or indiffuse a lot of hydrogen by looking at the different hydrogen species, even make that hydrogen go to the grain boundaries and passivate it. And then you suddenly create a, a really high quality multicrystalline material that's cheap in production, but that actually have the qualities to reach these above 20% efficiencies. So that's very important. Uh, a lot of work is also being put into, e even at industrial scale, uh, to making what's called PERC cells. Um, and, and this is inspired by the PERC and PEARL technologies where um, you passivate uh, the surfaces uh, also on the rear and make local uh, contacts um, instead of putting a metal on the whole rear, which is the sort of industrial standard, you actually only make local contacts and that means you have an almost perfectly passivated rear surface and you only have direct contact between metal and silicon where you need to in order to extract the current. Um, so taking that uh, passivated uh, rear technology from the lab and to the industry is a really important step towards high efficiency multicrystalline. And, and, and I think that's a way to, to really uh, push industrial mass produced cells to very high efficiencies. Um, if we then look at uh, an electrically optimized multicrystalline cell um, and say, what can we do to push that further? Uh, if it's still blue, uh, if, when you look at it on the roof, it reflects blue light that could be used in the cell, um, especially if the front surface is well passivated, so short wavelengths can, can be useful when you look at the quantum efficiency. Um, so there are novel texturing techniques uh, like black silicon that, that I'm working with could be relevant uh, for, for multicrystalline uh, cells in, in an, at an industrial scale. Again, you have to optimize the electrical properties with one hand and the optical properties with the other hand in order to really push the efficiency.